Well, I'm not going to be nearly that interested. <laughs> so, uh, I'll do my best. Um, so I'm the uh, executive director of Free State Legal Project, which is a startup here in Baltimore. Uh, and, and our goal is to serve um, low-income LGBT uh, citizens um, with legal services and other, other, other services that we can provide. So there's a lot of people in the room that are affiliated with Free State Legal Project as volunteers or partners or board members. Can you raise your hands if you are? Yes, Lee. So what we're all trying to do, um, along with a lot of other people, is now that we have marriage equality in Maryland, which seems to be this unfortunate prerequisite to advancing any other form of LGBT rights um, throughout the country, uh, now that we have same-sex marriage in Maryland, we see an opportunity to build, um, and a couple other organizations in the country are doing the same thing, uh, to build a model for low-income LGBT advocacy, to tackle those 99% of issues that are not necessarily connected with marriage, do not arise out of um, marriage, a person's marital status, and are more connected to a person's low income status as an LGBT person. So employment discrimination, um, housing discrimination, and a lot of school-based discrimination and discrimination in the foster care system, which is why I'm uh, here today. So in addition to providing legal services, we also provide uh, or we also undertake policy initiatives, systemic policy initiatives, and outreach and education initiatives. One of the things that we're trying to uh, look at, and I heard Shannon use the uh, popular um, school to prison pipeline term, is the LGBT school to prison pipeline. Um, because LGBT kids, as they progress through school in the foster care system and often uh, end up in the juvenile justice system, face very unique barriers. Um, that can be addressed at a policy level. So we've brought together um, a number of people, including people from the governor's office and DSS and all of the relevant agencies to form an LGBT youth roundtable with the goal of addressing the, the very unique LGBT youth experience um, in Maryland. Uh, I'm not going to go into a policy diatribe. I'm actually going to try and focus on store a few brief stories today um, to demonstrate what I mean. Um, again, I'm, I'm more a direct services person at this point. I'm not a policy expert. Um, we're trying to get there. So I think stories are better. Um, I'm going to start with the story of this was actually a white transgender girl in Baltimore County. Um, who went to a school that uh, is a rather privileged um, public high school. Uh, she was bullied and harassed for um, two years. She filed 20 bullying reports with the school, uh, and the school had done nothing. She had no disciplinary record um, and was a relatively successful student. She was finally one day after school called a tranny faggot by one of the boys who had continuously harassed her. They got into a fight, like duh, this was going to happen eventually, <laughs> and they immediately recommended her for expulsion. Uh, so Free State Legal stepped in and went to the school to they have what's called a superintendent's designee, and these hearings are held in front of the superintendent's designee. And so we went in, and I sat there while the mother um, she had actually had very supportive parents. Her mother described how she was terrified to lose her daughter, um, sobbing because the daughter had uh, been suicidal for the past two years. Um, and I explained to the school system um, that they were in violation of XYZ laws and policies, including Title IX. And the whole thing ended up working itself out, and they backed off, and they implemented some trainings in the school. Um, but this is a rather, it's, this is, most stories don't end up going that well. Um, schools are not in compliance with uh, federal and state anti-bullying policies that require them to do certain things to ameliorate LGBT bullying in their schools. And most of the kids, uh, the LGBT kids who are bullied and face these sort of really horrible situations don't make it the Free State Legal Project. Um, a lot of them, especially in Baltimore City, uh, end up on the streets, their families reject them, um, and they, they, they end up going down this school to juvenile justice pipeline. The next step of uh, the journey for many of them is the foster care system. 
So I had one student who had a very similar situation. She was African American in Baltimore City. She'd been rejected by her family. Uh, she came to me while she was living with a foster family and um, said, I'm experiencing all of this bullying in schools. My foster family doesn't know how to help me. They can't, they're, they're very religious. Um, they were actually somewhat nice people. You know, I called them a couple times and they were interested in helping uh, this foster, this transgender girl who was in their, under their care. But they were also very religious and would proselyze to her every single night. Um, so this story doesn't really have an ending. I never heard, after a couple meetings, I never heard from that girl again. I called her foster family. They said, we haven't heard from her either in two and a half weeks. She ran away from home because the foster care system, I think, um, the reason is because the foster care system doesn't have screening protocols and training mechanisms in place to teach foster families when they have LGBT kids who have run away from their own homes or been kicked out, how to properly foster an LGBT kid not to proselyze to them, what, you know, how to talk to them, what the pronouns to use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many of them just end up out on the streets. What I imagine happened to um, that girl is that she ended up uh, hooking up with a community of trans girls and women in Baltimore City. Um, and most likely, based on the evidence that's been presented to me and all of my clients who I've worked with, most likely she now engages in sex work. Um, I can't put a percentage on that, what percentage of trans black girls in Baltimore City end up in sex work, but it's extremely, extremely high. Uh, which brings me to my third story. Uh, transgender um, sex workers in Baltimore City uh, are sort of, this is where the problems that started with schools and being bullied and harassed. Um, families being re rejecting them, foster families not knowing how to care for them. They end up in sex work and um, build these uh, long rap sheets that further marginalize them and create it almost impossible for them to integrate into society and get jobs because background checks are conducted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Free State Legal has partnered with the state's attorney's office, believe it or not, and a number of other nonprofits uh, and organizations in Maryland to create what we call the Transgender Action Group. And this is a bare bones response to uh, the commercial sex um, problem facing transgender girls in Baltimore City. We go out twice a month and we get engaged in bare bones outreach, condoms. We go until three or four in the morning. Miriam, who's here, uh, participates and a couple other people in the room have gone out with us. And we um, try, the goal is over the long term, one to two years, we'll hook some of these girls up with um, housing resources, legal resources, um, healthcare resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and bring them out of the commercial sex work that they're engaged in and try and get them jobs and integrate them into society and uh, demarginalize this population. Um, so that's really the, an overview of the work we're trying to do with regard to LGBT youth. We're doing really grassroots work. Um, I believe it starts, from our experience, we can see it starting with schools and schools being ill-prepared and ill-equipped to handle LGBT kids who are harassed. And the problems just go from there. So there's this whole pipeline that we at Free State Legal Project are trying to um, address. Thank you.